with the with with our with our lovely pal Malcolm Denare, is that how you pronounce his last name? Who is a lovely gentleman, and uh, I thought it was a great interview. With that in mind, here's the short version of of my. No, oh, no, you can't no, do the short version. version. Hold on, hold on. Here's the short talk, version. Hold on, here's, hold on, hold on, guys. Jesus always, fucking Christ! Always... Shut up! <laughs> shut up! Seriously, shut the fuck up! Here's the short version of my review. I'm from the West Coast. Here's the long version of my review. <laughs> All right, now let's just get this out of the way, shall we? Heaven Help Us, 1985, directed by Michael Dinner, is a snooze fest. Brother Detloff, why oh why did you assign it to me? How about Oh God with George Burns or Heaven Can Wait with Warren Beatty or Monty Python's Life of Brian? Beridiana by Luis Buñuel, A Serious Man by the Coen Brothers. Hell, I'd take a shot at the Bells of St. Mary's, or Bruce Almighty, or better still, Battlefield Earth. Bruce or fuck Almighty. it, let's go for the gold, Passion of the Christ, the greatest religious comedy of all time. Now, I would like to prevent anyone remotely curious about this film from ever watching it. This is some weak sauce, even by 1980s standards. It is a relic. It is of interest only to connoisseurs of the hazy nostalgia that most 80s movies have accumulated like a layer of thick dust. If you must know the plot, and it's generous to call it so, the plot concerns the new kid at a Catholic school in Brooklyn somewhere in the 50s or 60s. Who really cares when? He befriends the class brainiac, clashes with the most sadistic of the teachers, meets a pretty girl, and muddles through as only Andrew McCarthy at his most milk toast could. There are accompanying pop songs on the soundtrack, gloomy fall photography, student infighting, struggles with cler clerical schoolmasters, pranks, and I'm already so fucking bored I want to shoot myself. <laughs> I did give it a chance. The early scenes of priests meanly twisting students' ears and tongues, smacking hands, banging heads will make you cringe. My parents used to tell me of nuns wrapping their knuckles with rulers and angry Irish priests lifting boys off their feet by the sideburns. And my father once said that Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt explained at last why he had such a miserable childhood in Catholic school. If the film had made this vein of throbbing cruelty in the Catholic Church at central theme, it might have gone places. But no. It wanders off into mediocre teen comedy territory and even then only half-assed. But a love story so limp the romantic leads simply wait around for it to die. There is a resident bully with his requisite comeuppance. To wit, a girl he's trying to lay pukes on him, and his car is trashed in an unfunny Buster Keaton bit involving a drawbridge and that guy from the David Letterman show. Wallace Shawn also collects his check in a funny walk-on, then walks right off, perhaps smelling a stinker. The whole movie is just so goddamn meh. Plots like these were stale before movies even had sound, for Christ's sake. Every subplot in this movie had been done better or elsewhere long before 1985. So by the time the students finally voice their rebellion against the sadistic teacher, the moment hasn't been earned. We've been through too many unfocused digressions to give a shit. There are plenty of Catholic schools out there in real life that put students through the kind of cruelty of peppering this film. And worse, much worse. I'd rather see a documentary about that, or a real drama about it, or even a sadistic comedy about it. What I can't stand is when a movie finds something interesting and immediately flees in the opposite direction, straight into the waiting arms of mediocrity. So, why, Brother Detloff, why? Is it a personal favorite? I think we've established that. If so, then you have sinned against me, my brother, and your penance shall be thus. Ten episodes of Star Trek's The Next Generation, <laughs> one full viewing of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and 1,500 words on the musical career of William Shatner. Well, first of all, now go, my brother, and sin no more. First of all, I have no problem watching Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. It's a fine film. Ever. I have, Fucking awesome. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's, I, I'll gladly, that's, that's not a punishment, Billy. I'll do, I'll well, do then, that with a great grin. Well, then, fantastic. So, Which, obviously, you couldn't have a great grin watching Heaven Help Us. I, I, I had the occasional grin. I thought that, uh, I thought that Wallace Shawn was funny. I thought that, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I thought uh, the Caesar character, I thought Malcolm Denari's character was the funniest. I was just curious why the hell this Jewish kid was walking through this movie. Like as soon as he walked on, I was like, what the hell is this kid doing in this movie? And I, I actually, to the point that I, I Googled him trying to find out if he was actually Italian or Irish or something. And I thought uh, they were going to play and he, it for a laugh. Like I was just waiting for like the joke that he's really, he's secretly a Jew. 
Well, knowing now and, that and like it's kind of like the ha ha, see the Jewish kid in the Catholic school, and he's the smartest one there. Like it's I thought that would be the joke. Queen that Michael Den- or Malcolm Denari is Jewish, and he was in that movie while Celtic rock music plays in the background of the soundtrack. Uh, I think that's more <laughs> hilarious than anything the movie itself has to offer. But then again, well, that said, I don't think any any of them really look very um, like convincingly New York. To be uh, to be honest with you, that did that did that was sort of a distraction to me. You know, you hear and... that accent, folks. You hear that accent. That that's authority. Well, he well, Joe, <laughs> right you there. are right that's about that. that. Well, in fairness to the McCarthy character, he moved from somewhere else. From Boston. Yes, I know. Well, well they had. I think. I think when they saw Andrew McCarthy and they put him in, you know, obviously, I guess, you know, he was a teen draw or whatever. The like they had to say that he he moved in from another, you know, place. You know, like there was no other way around it. Like Dylan could almost pass. I get. You know what I mean? Like some of the other kids. I, I don't know. But you get. You definitely get the sense. Like, or at least I do, that it would have been nice to see. Like you know you know some actual people from the streets of new york in there you know at least this movie is phony as a two dollar bill yeah wow. kevin dylan in the performance of a lifetime <laughs> I, th- <laughs> I i you know man i don't have any i don't have any real attachment to this film i i think this is, might be the first maybe the second like maybe i've seen i think i've seen bits and pieces of it before so, yeah, so I mean, what what was your viewing like? Yeah, yeah, I I I've only seen bits and pieces of it before this viewing, and I watched it, and um, I was a bit ambivalent about it. I didn't hate it. I think that I I think that I was able to relate to it just from being on the East Coast. You know, I, I was born in the Bronx. I know that's not Brooklyn, but it's sort of in the area where. Like I could see my father and my parents really would have uh, related to this film a lot, so thereby I was able to right. sort of see through see through that. Like like I moved out of the city when I was probably eight years old or something like that. So, but my fa- my family lives in the city, so there was a lot of that like going on. Like I went, to, I did start to go to school there, you know. So I was able to relate to it and and get it. And I do think that what what the dude um the writer uh purpura i guess his name is uh-huh. i think that there was really something genuine there and i th- I think that yeah it probably just got uh, tw- uh pushed through the teen um 80s mill a little bit which kind of um you know diluted it, its authenticity obviously okay, but, but mccarthy wasn't uh, he wasn't anything yet like i mean this is really one of his first starring roles i mean this is this is before, like, the two or three years before Pretty in Pink. Okay. Uh, two years uh, before Less Than Zero. I mean, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, well, let's get Andrew McCarthy in here, you know, because he's, you know, right, those '80s movies, in, those those teen Listen, '80s movies in and stuff. Guys, you, Tom, you and and Joe T obviously saw this movie at a certain time and place, and it's it holds a special place in your heart i i i think if you look at it objectively it's not much of a movie i don't know how you know it how do you but separate i, I hear you things? but when i watched it the other night i i had to look at it like that i but i can watch listen i can go back and watch mark's brothers movies that uh, i saw okay, when i, I hear you but i but I, I know what you're saying but i when i watched it the other night i paid attention to the to to the performances and i paid attention to the feel and I paid attention to the the screenplay which I think is really really good Taverny you got to come in here and you know uh, defend this I mean, film. I'm yeah, very, I mean I'm very I'm uh, very biased I was I think I was in 7th grade Catholic school when I first saw that movie so you know I was living it not 1950s but I was living it we used to have uh, whatever priest was in the confessional we try to switch lines with the girls on the line with the priests that we thought would be asleep or not care because some priests would come out and pull you by the hair. And, um, you know, when Kevin Dillon's giving orders exactly how many lies to tell and, you know, just, you forget how absurd it was growing up telling a grown man through a sheet of paper, what, how many times you, you jerked off or you, you cursed at your mom, you know, then you see Kevin Dillon writing down like the details on how to get away with it. Then you realize, shit, I, I took that seriously for ten years of my life. Yeah. So it's Tom, like were you, Tom, were you Catholic? You, no, you're Catholic. No, no not you're, at all. Okay. Billy, listen, Billy's 
he's not far off, obviously, when he says that. It's just probably something that I saw when I was young and it affected me and I've carried it like on with me, you know, throughout my life. So I probably hold it at a high standard, which may or may or not be, you know, a good thing. So you guys saw this when you were like 13. Like yeah. 13, I saw it when it was out, like in 85, like, that's the, like I was like, 12 or 13. Yeah. yeah. That's the perfect storm to watch a high school movie because you're looking at these kids who were like, you are going to be those kids like in another year or two, you know what right. I mean? So right. it's They're like re- adults to, you know, to, to, right. Right. So it's like you, it's really charged. You know what I mean? Your experience with that is really charged. Like, like, I remember seeing all the, like, to me, it wasn't this film in particular, but it was, you know, all those John Hughes films. Right. Like, I think they're friggin' great, you know what I mean? But I'm sure if someone who hasn't seen, like, 16 Candles and, um, oh, I don't know, you know, Pretty in Pink and all that stuff, I'm like, I, those whole... Uh, well, when you go back and look at those movies now, objectively, even there, I mean, as much as I kind of revered John Hughes for a while. You look at those movies now, and they're pretty stale. I mean, well, you know what? I, I haven't did seen see the Breakfast Club in a while, I, I but see, I love pretty, the Breakfast Club I think so the much. Breakfast Club man. is really good too. I think if I went back and looked at it, it would probably stand up better than you know all the other John Hughes. I think movies. I think yes. that the Breakfast Club is something that, like, it can be timeless, especially with the youth. I think that even a high schooler today could watch the Breakfast Club and and relate to it. Baby's Day Out. Help define a generation. Uh, Pace, how do you feel about Heaven Help Us? Did you have a good time? You know what I did? This is a weird fucking movie. And uh, it, it, it's... I don't know. It's obviously this like deeply personal thing for the guy who wrote it because it's such a fucking mess. Like, it, it, it's... It, it's Because it, it's, like, really dark and, and horrible. And then it's really funny. And then it's really dark and horrible all over again. And there's just this like grim specter of like abuse and and awfulness that just coats everything in this movie and makes it everything kind of weird. And so the fact that they managed to like get funny out of that as well is awesome. Like I I, I appreciated that. I was like, okay, this can make me laugh, even though this whole thing is saturated in horrible abuse and weird shit. Uh, I dug it. I, I, I thought that was fun, and, and, and I genuinely thought, like, that's, that Caesar kid is fucking hilarious. Like, he was funny as shit. Caesar's the best part of the movie. Yeah, he is I would watch, funny I would watch as movie. shit. I want to see I want to see the movie where uh, Caesar, as a Jew in disguise, has to go to a Catholic school. <gasps> I want to see the whole movie from his perspective. Dude, I thought that would be the joke. That's, I, that's, Billy, that's what uh, I want it to happen. When I went to Catholic school, the, uh, the Catholic school was a dying out you know there's like 12 kids in a class so the public schools are so bad they were taking on anybody who wanted to get out of the public schools so we only had about nine catholic kids there was a jewish kid in my class the indian kid in my class there's <laughs> that's the movie i want to see <laughs> there was an indian kid joe there was joe right joe no, you, you write know that no movie? you know i'm trying to think of his name god i can't believe oh Todd Salon should make that friggin' movie. That, that that was was sick. Fucking yeah. Like, 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 have you, like, I was thinking, like, um, Joe, you were talking about earlier, like, every character could, like, have a spin off. Like, like, I guess in the 80s, everybody would get their own, like, theme song and have, like, a sitcom <laughs> or something. But, like, if they, like, if you made a movie about Caesar, uh, the, like, it would be, it would be friggin' great. Like, um, the last Todd Salon's movie is almost that, uh, God, Tom, what is it? Help me out here, man. Palindromes? Not palindromes. No. 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 Oh Jesus. Err. Oh, it's great, man. The I, last uh, hot sal- the last hot salons film that he put out is freaking great. And it would be uh it's good to note here because it it, it's it is see what Caesar would be doing today. But Billy, um you're saying it's it was cliched like the other eighties films, but they have a guy getting caught masturbating in every possible scenario, including <laughs> a church. <laughs> And I yeah. thought that was, a, I mean, a little bit racy, at least, but, you know, a little bit different than the other ones. Mm, I, I, I didn't really. I the only really original bit I thought was hilarious was that uh, 
the that masturbating kid wanted to be an altar boy so bad so he could be up close when they put the wafer in the girl's oh, mouth. Oh, that was a great. That was scene. amazing. I thought that, that was awesome. that was genius. I thought that, that was, was a, like because I, I had never out, thought about it before. <laughs> yeah, he he passes out from a rush of blood out of his head and into his nether regions, <laughs> which is great. It's like in the in the, in the thing that I think is brilliant about that is even though I didn't grow up Catholic, you know, my relatives were all Catholic, so I was at a funerals and weddings a lot at the Catholic church and then saw the the mass a lot and all that shit and never in a million years would I have thought that someone could fetishize that <laughs> and then like it's brilliant like I, that's the best scene <laughs> in the movie that's, that's, the that's what scene. Catholics do is fetishize that's, shit do you think right. those men dressing they, they up like in black capes and hanging out with altar boys there's no fetishes <laughs> What is the, yeah, those are the those are the obvious ones though. <laughs> the wafer was less obvious. <laughs> Billy, you said that uh, you you know how the movie has like this uh, like the weather like the like like it's gloomy and and you you seem to have a a problem with that. I remember Joe and I having this discussion about uh, how how we both liked the scene when McCarthy and Mary Stuart Masterson were walking along the beach and how we you know I think it, it was I who said that it's kind of like foreshadowing that the like you know that gloomy weather you know the the you know the rain you know just the gloomy the, the gloomy feel kind of foreshadows the fact that this relationship is just it's doomed right from the beginning uh i don't you know the the coney island stuff is okay i i didn't you know i i can't muster enough to really care about that relationship at all i didn't think it was an interesting I thought it was completely dull. I thought she was an uninteresting character. I, I nothing really. I have nothing to offer on that. The cinematography itself, I didn't think. I don't think it's bad because it's gloomy. I I like that stuff. You know, like as a kid growing up in Southern California, I would see movies like this, and everything was brick and gray colored. And I was like, what universe do these movies come from? And I really, then I moved to Boston. I really and, love uh, those exterior, um, like schoolyard yeah. scenes and stuff. I love yeah. that, the way that's. I actually like that stuff. I, it wasn't a negative comment to say that it was gloomy cinematography. I, I think that it fits the movie, you know? Right. Um, I just don't, you know, the love story itself is well, just Dolesville. There, there's a whole period where that's how you photographed New York. Yeah, you, you know, like that's yeah, just before, how it was yeah, done. You before Sex in the it City, gloomy and dark, and and it it had some edge and some mystery to it and some sleaze to it, and yeah, now it's Sex in the City. Before they turned Times Square into a Disney World. <laughs> hey Tom, Mary Stuart Masterson. There's a whole thing around her, is there? Like she was a. Can you give me some background on her? I know you have more information on her. Well, like, I mean, the only you know. The only thing I really know about her is, you know, what she's been in. I mean, right. I don't know. I don't know much. What, about what was? Her it? What else was she in? Because I know that she, some she's like Benny haunts my. Yeah. Okay. The, the, what, some kind of wonderful. Okay. Is, with Eric Stoltz, uh, which is a John Hughes production. Like right. that's that's you know that was probably one of her, one of her bigger roles without a doubt. Why, why are you curious about her? No, no, she like haunts the like my my uh, you know teen thoughts you know so i was just trying to figure out places you know she's like one of those it's so funny because like all like those girls like that were always cast in in those movies the uh ali sheedy's the uh i guess the demi moore's uh particularly molly ringwald mary stewart masterson uh i don't i never found any of them attractive like like even like you know as a kid as an adult i just not even molly ringwald i don't i yeah i just never I never f- no. I I just no. Oh, but, what's the Fast Times at Ridgemont high, high girl that you? Phoebe were? Cates. There you go. No, is that her? Yeah, yeah. I think. That's yeah, her, but yeah. she wasn't kind of like in that like Brad pack. Like she she was never in that Brad packy uh, uh, world where Ma- Ma- Mary Stuart Masterson kind of like she floated around it. Right. You know. Right. Uh, I will say when we were talking about going back and rewatching films, I did see a little bit of Sixteen Candles not too long ago, and boy, was Molly Ringwald's dialogue wooden the way she delivered some of that dialogue. Like I was like, I was shocked at how like how flat her performance is. It, it was it was really it was really stunning to me to see to see that actually, man. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what Mary Stuart Masterson is in? Uh, it's a really good movie with uh, Sean, with Sean Penn and Christopher Walken. Uh, really, uh, oh, at, yeah. at close, at close range, right, Joe? Yeah. 
Yeah, the this, coyote scene. <laughs> dude, that that movie. Have you guys ever seen that? I don't think I have. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's really really dark, and it's it's man, it's kind of creepy. Walking, Joe T. T Walking's like really creepy, right? He plays Penn's father. And yeah, like, but he's uh, been out of their life for thirty years and comes right. back to show them how the, to be criminals. How to be criminals? Yeah, and it's really disturbing what what happens you know because of you know what what goes on but and walking has like this i remember he had like more, a dis- more disturbing than walking being your father <laughs> <laughs> very true but uh yeah she's in that show if, if there's a movie you want to see with her in it uh <laughs> it's it's definitely uh, gonna, i'm gonna have to go on a mary stewart masterson uh, yeah thing. you go go on a ticker <laughs> Mary no, Stewart so. Master Baderson, right? <laughs> That's right. You know what I'm by by a strange yeah. coincidence, Woo! I'm I'm programming I'm programming episode 37 to be an all Mary Stewart Masterson <laughs> episode. Thank so. God, thank God, it's oh, high t- it's high time, Billy. I did I yeah. only I did I did find Leah Thompson attractive though. Oh, that's right, Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck. She was all right in Howard the Duck. Uh, Howard the Unwatchable. <laughs> That's what they should have called it. Uh, anybody else have anything to add to Heaven Help Us? And Billy, I'm so sorry that you found this movie so trite. I I, I really am. Billy, I think I don't... Some, another reason I might have liked it so much is uh, some of the smaller roles were given to really great actors like Sutherland and Wallace Shawn. Right. John so even Curry. though they had you know 10 minutes on screen, maybe less, I think it filled out the movie a little bit more for me. Um, they, they gave uh, a little more character to those smaller parts. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we didn't even talk about the fact that the great Donald Sutherland is uh, is in this movie. But you're right, yeah, and John Hurt, he has too. A, he has a perm or something in this movie, too. <laughs> yeah. It's worse than a perm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Joe, hit or miss on this one. Oh, oh man! Oh, wrong joke. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, <laughs> no, Christiana, hit or miss. Okay. I know uh, what tavern he's in. I'm not even going to ask him. <laughs> um, it's difficult for me, man. I, you know, listen. If you if you're a fan, if you're going to be a fan of this film, you probably already are. I don't know if that makes that, any no, sense. That you makes know what I mean? Sense. That yeah, sense. like I, I think. Very I think good words. Yeah. But I would say like better '80s retro movies that or were probably. Uh, I really like Peggy Sue Got Married. Oh. Um, Stand by Me was a great retro film from the Such 80s. A pansy Joe. Back to the Future. Rob Reiner. <laughs> Those Prince. are all great films. Yeah, Rob Reiner, <laughs> Francis Ford Coppola. Yeah. Uh, uh, I Ron know, man, but, but yeah. that's. Uh, I mean, the, those guys are making the good. <laughs> but that said, you know, I mean, Rumblefish is great, man. Yeah, Rumblefish. The the 80, you know, and so is The Outsiders. Yeah, yeah awesome. those are good movies, yeah, man. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, those are probably better uh, nostalgia films, but I would say that if you're from, you know, New York in the 60s, I mean, you'd probably get a real kick out of this. Uh, I know my parents would, for sure, for sure. So, Billy, he made Coppola, but real quick on the, because uh, he mentioned Rumblefish and, and, you know, I said The Outsiders. If I if my memory serves me correctly, Coppola made those movies, like he did like a whole, like he spent like two years doing S.C. Hinton, like he did The Outsiders, and then he made Rumblefish, like, right after that. Did, did he not? Yeah, something like that, yeah, yeah. that's weird. I mean, that's... With cast crossovers, too. Aren't there guys in both movies? Yeah, well, I, Matt I, Dillon, I... yeah, definitely. And I'm sure there's there's more, but Matt Dillon specifically is in is in both movies. And also in Rumblefish, is a very, you get a very young uh, Mickey Rourke, who plays uh, Motorcycle Boy. Mickey Rourke is really good in that yeah, one, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing, man. I hate it, it was honestly a moral conflict within me, especially after yeah, listening to uh, the lovely Malcolm Denari's uh interview. Like it's not fair for me to go and shit on a movie that people really like, but it's also not fair for me to be dishonest about no, not at how all. I view something that I've never seen before and I'm coming right. in cold. I know nothing about it and I just have to give an honest review. I, and, of it, you, so. and that's fine. And I, but that, that's the thing. And I completely respect that. You know, I mean, we always talk about on the show how, you know, it's important for, you know, for someone who's going to critique a film and for someone who's going to make a film to have open dialogues, to, to exchange ideas. So, you know, not liking something or liking something could be equally effective. You, you, you know what I'm saying? So, Indeed. You know, that's that's what we're all about here. Joe Taverny, and- uh, I want to thank you for coming on and, and, and doing this with me, man. Thanks for having me back, guys. 
I I really uh, I miss it's, you, dude. It's good talking to you, Joe. I miss you too, man. All right, Billy, I miss you. You should come on the show more often. Oh wait, Dave, have you ever met Joe Taverny? I have not. I have not. <laughs> That's crazy. You're gonna miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> He's gonna stalk you. He's gonna stalk you all over the internet, Dave. You watch out. I miss you already. <laughs> Oh, all right, guys. Thanks a lot for doing Heaven Help Us. We have uh, just a second half to do uh, before we uh, wrap things up. And we're going to talk about the Bill Maher, Larry Charles documentary from 2008, Religious. And Mr. Joe Christiana is going to set us up. Christiana, get it done, bro.